So in this video we're going to be talking about bronchiasthma, the etiology, pathogenesis, diagnosis and treatment. So according to the guiding GINA guidelines, asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways that causes recurrent episodes of wheezing, breathlessness, chest tightness and cough, particularly during the nights and early in the morning. Hallmarks of the disease usually include intermittent and reversible airway obstruction, hence why we can treat it with medication to relieve, relieve and alleviate the condition, chronic bronchial inflammation with eosinophils. Remember, eosinophils are only seen in hypersensitivity reactions such as asthma, bronchial smooth muscle hypertrophy and hyperreactivity, also known as hyperresponsiveness. So if there's a hyperresponsive action of the bronchial smooth muscle, then there'll be contraction of the bronchial lumina, which will lead to wheezing and breathlessness. Now, before we get into the whole aspect of why exactly is asthma and where does it affect, we need to exactly focus on the anatomy of the airways that's involved. So on the left, we can start off on the right um, by looking at the screen. So basic illustration here where the mouse is pointing to, we have first the respiratory epithelium and beneath that we have a basement membrane. Beneath the basement membrane we have something known as the lamina propria. The lamina propria contains the peribronchial glands and then beneath that we have a, a muscular layer and then again the submucosal layer which contains glands as well as cartilage. So on the left we have a histological side so you can see the normal respiratory epithelium where the mouse is pointed to now. The normal respiratory epithelium of the airways is pseudostratified columnar epithelium, ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium and beneath that you can see if you were to zoom in on a histological slide which I haven't got on the slide in, in front of you right now you would find goblet cells. Goblet cells you know are mucin producing cells so they produce mucus. Beneath this we have the lamina propria and then we have the smooth muscle layer. Within the lamina propria over here on the where the mouse is pointed to you can see the peribronchial glands which also secretes mucus and various other inflammatory processes. Then we have the smooth muscle layer and the submucosal glands. So you can and the cartilage. So we can see in another view, you have a pseudostratified ciliated column epithelium first, then we have the lamina propria which contains peribronchial glands, then smooth muscle, then tunica submucosa which also contains bronchial glands, then the hyaline cartilage and tunica adventitia. Pause the video and make sure you know the histology so that you can understand exactly where in this where in the bronchial lumen and where in the bronchial um, anatomy is the hypersensitivity type 1 reaction taking place. Now, asthma may be categorized into two categories, atopic asthma and non-atopic asthma. During this video, we're going to be talking about atopic asthma because that's the more common type of asthma, usually beginning within childhood, and it's a classical example of type 1 IgE mediated hypersensitive reaction. So whenever you think of asthma, you're always thinking of atopic asthma. This is caused by allergens, pollens, reactions, various different things. Inflammation usually involves, the main thing I want you to take away from this is the role of type 2 TH2 helper cells and they play a critical role in asthma. So people with asthmatic conditions or pre-genetic disposition to asthmatic usually have an increased number of TH2 helper cells or an increased hypersensitivity of these TH2 helper cells and increased hypersensitivity of TH2 helper cells is commonly referred to as type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. The classic atopic, uh, atopic form of asthma is associated with an excessive TH2 reaction against environmental ant antigens. This next paragraph is very important because TH2 usually accounts for features of asthma. TH2 helper cells, which will be illustrated in the next slide, usually secretes three molecules that you need to know about. Interleukin-4, Interleukin-5 and Interleukin-13, so 4, 5 and 13. Interleukin-4 usually when goes on to then stimulate IgE production. 5 goes on to activate and aggregate eosinophils and 13 goes on to uh, aggregate and activate mucus cells in order to produce mucus and also promote IgE production. So on the screen now we have, so we know that people with atopic asthma or type 1 hypersensitivity usually have an increased TH2 helper cells. So these TH2 helper cells get activated the moment there's some sort of pollen or an allergen or a various sort of antigen that comes into play with the respiratory epithelium. So you can see a pollen coming in and then it causes a TH2 helper cell to be activated. There is a huge initiation and activation process prior to this, which I have not gone into this video. You will need to search that up yourself. So once you have the TH2 activated, 
they then cause IL-4, IL-5 and IL-13 which is not highlighted on the screen. You can see IL-4 causes B cells, mature B cells within your um, body to secrete what's known as IgE antibodies. IgE antibodies then goes on to activate mast cells. IL-5 is, interleukin-5 is also secreted by TH2 which aggravates and causes eosinophil aggregation within the site of inflammation i.e. near the area where near the respiratory epithelium where all of this is taking place. So now we have mast cells, eosinophils. Eosinophils usually becomes activated and release granules and mediators which I will touch upon later on in this video. So you understand that part. TH2 causes IL-4, IL-5 and IL-13. Mast cells and eosinophils are the main two components they come into action. Now, what it, what happens here on the right? So again, we have the antigen, so we have the respiratory epithelium. The antigen comes into play. So next time you have um, some sort of asthmatic reaction or you, um, you have been exposed to pollen or an allergen or something, there's two types of response. There's an immediate response, as shown in the bottom. It usually happens within minutes. And there's a late response, Let's talk about the immediate response. During the immediate response, the antigen comes into play, causes vagal nerve activation. Vagal nerve, you know, goes on to stimulate the smooth muscle. So therefore, contraction takes place first. You already have previously produ produced mast cells, which are already known, or IgE antibody, which are specific to asthma. So as soon as these antigens come in, the eosinophils already recognize them and start to uh, secrete and release granules or mediators, which go on to activate goblet cells within found within the respiratory epithelium to produce mucus. Then the mast cells can go on to um, late phase, which usually takes about hours. They go on to activate basophils, eosinophils, and various other components within the um, immune system. They all then go on to cause various different uh, functions, such as uh, disruption within the mucosal lining, as well as increased hypertrophic submucosal glands and increased goblet cell production so therefore even more further mucus and even further muscle contraction so therefore you end up having something known as airway remodeling if you haven't understood exactly what I've said now don't worry as we go along in the slide you will, it will make more sense so the most striking microscopic findings in someone with microscopic meaning from the outside so if you were to look into someone through a bronchoscopy or a bronchial lavage or something like this, or a fibro bronchoscopy, you would tend to see thick, tenacious mucus plugs which is being clogged up throughout the um, bronchi. Histologically, i.e. through microscope now, you would see something known as wells of shed of epithelium known as Cushman spirals, as well as charcoal Leiden crystals, which are a collection of crystalloids made up of eosinophilic esinoph proteins. You know eosinophilic proteins because there's high influx of eosinophils in asthma. Now, the main thing I wanted to talk about was the airway remodeling, which we mentioned. So what happens with someone who has a recurrent asthmatic attacks, also known as status asthmaticus, so someone who's constantly um, having asthma all the time. It's not just a one-off thing you, where you had it once and then it goes, but someone who's been constantly re-affected by it again and again, maybe numerous times throughout the day. Something known as a physiological process or an adaptation mechanism of the body's bronchial system or the respiratory system known as airway modeling takes place. This is when there's a thickening of the airway wall, sub-basement membrane fibrosis, an increased vascularity in submucosa and an increase in submucosal glands and goblet. So automatically your body has already taken a, a step action further in order to combat the asthma each, or the allergen each time it comes into play. So what's happened here is you have increase in submucosal glands, you have increase in vascularity of submucosa, hypertrophy of the and hyperplasia of the bronchial muscle, and there's also cell metaplasia. Metaplasia means replacement of normal cell, um, normal respiratory epithelium by a different cell, usually by squamous cell. When you know the normal one is columnar epithelium, they get replaced to squamous cell. So there's thickening of air walls, sub membrane fibrosis, increased vascularity, an increase in submucosal glands and goblet cells, and hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the bronchial muscle. Now the classification of asthma. So far we talked about atopic asthma. There's also non-atopic asthma. So this is when usually due to viruses, rhinovirus, adenovirus, parainfluenza virus, and other air pollutants such as sulfur dioxide, nitrogen, and common. Exercise-induced asthma can be people who um, tend to like um, 
you know, is induced from um, high intensity exercise. Occupational asthmas are also very common. They can be stimulated by resins, epoxy resins, organics, aspartose, wood, cotton, platinum gases, and various other chemicals. Drug induced asthma is very important because some people with asthma usually are very sensitive to aspirin and they have recurrent rhinitis when they take aspirin usually it makes the condition worse or induces asthma so think about prescribing aspirin if to an asthma patient you should not do this because they're contraindicated the reason why we the mechanism of we're not known is because we know aspirin is an NSAID non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug which usually inhibits the cyclooxygenase pathway and the arachnonic metabolism pathway so, and you know uh, but, um, without the affecting lipogenic uh, lipooxygenase route there usually is a imbalance and increased production of leukotrienes and leukotrienes usually cause bronchial spasm um, if you don't know anything about this do research on it in physiology you should have learned this now the diagnosis usually includes spirometry or peak flowmetry peak flowmetry greater than less than 60 or even less than 80 percent is usually considered a peak flowmetry for that age and the race and the sex is usually a predetermined factor if you score less than 80 percent then you're an increased risk of asthma even below 60 percent means you have asthma spirometry usually forced expiratory volume and forced vital capacity are both reduced so therefore fev1 is usually reduced in people with asthma asthma is can be cons uh, considered to be a obstructive disorder at the same time various people have said it's a restrictive disorder as well because usually what happens in asthma is the person can usually take in deep breaths even during the attack but they cannot expire the problem is during expiration reversibility and variability measurements so um yeah now symptoms usually include episodic bre uh, breathlessness wheezing wheezing is the classic symptom that you should look out for cough difficulty breathing after an incidental allergen exposure or some sort of um, they've exaggerated it by doing an exercise or running up the staircase or something like this usually they'll describe to you or even at workplace seasonal variability is very important because during summertime spring this is when everything uh, asthma is more worsened compared to like autumn um, positive family history of asthma you should ask for whether first degree relatives or second degree and whether they present with allergic rhinitis so if a patient walks into the clinic and you're the clinician or the doctor in charge or the nurse and they complain to you of shortness of breath, chest tightness, difficulty breathing, um, the first thing you should be thinking of is whether this person has a lung or a heart condition because they can be presenting with uh, chronic heart failure or congestive heart failure or various things. But when you find out, when you ask them the questions and you can find out that they they have symptoms because of work relation or exposure to uh, some sort of allergic conditions and things you can narrow it down to asthma now what are the treatments for asthma there are they are split into controllers and relievers now relievers are something that you would prescribe immediately on site because this is when usually during the attack of asthma you want to completely dilate the bronchial valves in order to increase the amount of air that gets in Controllers are more to do with long term or once you have kind of und um, made the asthmatic attack under control, then you can control it. So yeah, I hope you understand the meaning to the differences between that. Let's look at relievers first. The relievers include rapid acting beta 2 agonists like salbutamol is probably the famous one that you know. Others I've highlighted on the screen. You have short acting such as theophylline and short acting oral beta 2 antagonist agonists. Short acting beta 2 agonists should always be given with some sort of uh, corticosteroid because of its various adverse reactions. Now, controllers usually include systemic glucocorticoids such as prednisolone, beclomethasone, bometasone, fruticasone, and budesonide. Leukotriene modifiers, like we said, leukotriene also con uh, contributes towards um, asthma. asthma include montelukast, pranglucast, and safrilucast. You can kind of get the drugs name from the leukocyst, leukocyst and leukocyst from leukotriene. Long-acting inhaled beta-2 antagonists are the preferred um, ones. These include salmetrol and formetrol. Now there's a fixed combination, i.e. known as when you can prescribe both uh, long-acting inhaled beta antagonists as well as systemic glucocorticoids. Now the antagonists or the beta-2 antagonists, they usually work on the muscle cells, whereas the corticosteroids usually kind of 
work on the immune cells so they're two different things but both when working together can completely alleviate the symptoms now an example of a drug is serotide which contains both salmetrol which is a beta 2 long in long acting beta 2 in uh, antagonist agonist plus flu fluticasone which you know is a systemic glucocorticoid then there's another drug called Symbicort, Budesonide and Formetrol. Other drugs include anti-IG drugs, immunotherapy, hormones and sustained release theophylline. So thank you for watching.